In 2014, director Wes Anderson and star Ray Fiennes gave the world a tale of the search for a faint glimmer of civilization in the midst of a barbaric war. In 2022, we take a return trip to Kentucky to spend some time with the master of Turkey. The film is the Grand Budapest Hotel. The whiskey is Russell's Reserve Single Barrel. And more we'll review them both. This is the, the Film and Whiskey Podcast. Welcome to the Film and Whiskey Podcast, where each week we review a classic movie and a glass of whiskey. I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. And this week we are looking at the 2014 Wes Anderson comedy, The Grand Budapest Hotel. Now, Bob, we normally include Bob and Brad, but uh, it doesn't just mean the two of us today, does it? No, we're not even going to tease it today. We have a special guest with us, and it's uh, probably Film and Whiskey Nation's favorite special guest. If mm. I had to guess, they might just be their favorite host overall, above you and I. <laughs> Most likely. <laughs> We're joined by our friend, YouTuber and filmmaker Patrick H. Willems, back for the third time on the show. I have no idea why. Patrick, how are you today, man? I'm doing great, uh, especially you you know, hyping me up like that as you know, the, the, the favorite guest. That seems unlikely. I can't imagine that's true, but I'll, I'll, I'll take it anyway. Yeah, please do, because it, it's 100% factual. <laughs> for, for real, man. Well, again, you guys have sent me multiple bottles of whiskey in the mail, and so I'm just going to keep coming back as long as we <laughs> keep up this routine. <laughs> Sounds good to us, man. As long as the terms of the relationship are clear, we are, we're good to go. Exactly. By the way, this goes for anyone else with a podcast. Uh, mail me alcohol and I'll come on your show. <laughs> so it's been a little while since Patrick's been on the show. He joined us right at the beginning of season five to go over one of his favorite films, Charade. And he's back again for the Grand Budapest Hotel. But in the interim, uh, there have been some pretty major developments in Patrick's life and career. Namely, my guy is like a, an A-list filmmaker now. Uh, I've seen his name on marquees all across New York City. He's helped found Nebula, which is just incredible to hear those words. I feel like I'm talking to a combination of Spielberg and Zuckerberg right now. So, Patrick Willems, <laughs> catch us up a little bit, man. What have you been up to? Ah, uh, well, I, I'm trying to remember when exactly did we record the charade episode? I'd say it's been about nine or last ten year. months now. Yeah, it was last yeah. year sometime. I was actively working on the movie. Mm -hmm. At the time. And since then, uh, I finished it and my life is a lot less stressful now. Yeah. So uh, basically in, in the interim, I finished making my first feature length movie, a very silly, I guess you could call it a sci-fi musical comedy. Uh, that is also uh, a continuation and conclusion to the long running narrative from my channel, uh, meaning you've got to watch like a year and a half's worth of YouTube videos to understand this movie. So basically the equivalent of like, you know, any new Marvel movie. Um, but yeah, I, I made a movie. We actually finished it and it's out now on the streaming platform Nebula. Please, please go watch it and and validate <laughs> all, the last year of my life that I put into making this. <laughs> There's that trademark insecurity we look for in all of our our filmmakers. Uh, you've really arrived now, man. Thank you. I, I've got to ask. So I gave you the list of all of 32 movies or I think 29 as of right now, because we're doing listener picks for the last three. And you very quickly responded and said, hey, I want to do Grand Budapest. So what is it about this movie in particular that that jumped out to you from the list and even like among Wes Anderson's movies? Why is this the one for you? So I should say right now that I, I feel like this was maybe two months ago that I replied to your email and picked this one. So I can't remember what the other options were. So I, I can tell you why I like Grand Budapest a lot. I can't tell you why I picked it over other movies because I just can't remember what they were. Um, and I can't even... You, you, you were doing multiple Wes Anderson movies, right? 
Yeah, so we are we're at the tail end of a little mini series, and that's kind of how we had this season structured. But for Wes Anderson, we did uh, Rushmore and we did Moonrise Kingdom, and a few seasons back we looked at Royal Ten and Bombs. So this is actually the fourth Wes Anderson we've done on the show. Okay, so I will say so. My favorite Wes Anderson movie is actually Rushmore, which oh, is like nice. one of my top five films ever. Uh, I adore it. But I, I think I had just very recently talked about it on another podcast, and I was like, I don't want to just repeat the stuff I just said. <laughs> uh, so I went to my second favorite Wes Anderson movie, uh, The Grand Budapest Hotel, which I think, even though it's my second favorite, I think it might be his masterpiece. Mm. And in a, like in, in a lot of ways, the, the movie his entire career had been building to, mm-hmm. kind of like... The, the the movie that best encapsulates like ev- like who he is as a filmmaker, everything mm-hmm. that he does well. Uh, that's kind of you know, this movie kind of comments on his whole body of work uh, at once. Uh, it's also a lot of fun, um, yeah. <laughs> and so I, I it's it's a movie I love, and um, I, I probably hadn't watched it in a few years, and uh, so these are all the reasons that I picked it. Well, Brad, this was your first time seeing Grand Budapest. Is that correct? It sure was. Yeah. So coming off of the other three Wes Anderson movies that we did, what are your first impressions, man? I think that his other movies have a much more family friendly feel to them. (laughs) Uh, Even, you know, even with the swearing and the the stuff that goes on in them, this one seems to kick it up a notch. Mm -hmm. But I think that what Patrick said was kind of my basic takeaway from this film was that this feels like. Wes Anderson just taking his very specific style and his approach to the craft of filmmaking and just nuancing it enough where everything is smooth about this movie. Mm. Does that make sense? Like, it feels like in some of his other movies, his very specific style of directing has a few rough edges. And this one just doesn't have it like everything fits together perfectly without any issues. Yeah. And I I walked away just going, oh, this is like what Wes Anderson can do with his full powers. Before we get any further, we do need to go over to America's favorite segment, which we call Brad Explains. But before we get there, we want to give a quick plug for our Patreon account. Whether this is your first or your 100th episode of Film and Whiskey, we'd love to encourage you to go to patreon.com slash film whiskey, where you can support us at three different levels, a three, a five and a seven dollar a month tier. At all three levels, you get tons of bonus perks, including special episodes specifically for the patrons at the upper tiers. At all the tiers, you get access to a Discord server that Brad and I are on every single day talking with the members of Film and Whiskey Nation. That, again, is patreon.com slash film whiskey. Brad, it is time for Brad Explains, the part of the podcast where you break down the plot of the movie that you have just seen, often for the first time. We have put 60 seconds on the clock. Can you break down the plot of the Grand Budapest Hotel? I think I can, Bob. The Grand Budapest Hotel is a story about a writer who is hearing a tale about a aging high-class hotel. Uh, The owner of the hotel is recounting stories from his youth when he was the lobby boy at the hotel um, and as he was mentored by a very unique and eccentric uh, legendary concierge. They go on adventures together. They steal a painting Uh, from a very rich family that technically rightfully belongs to the concierge who sleeps with older older women, kind of like uh, the producers. Man, I I don't even know where to go. They steal the painting. They run away from the not-Nazi Nazis. Uh, They do crazy things. Willem Dafoe is terrifying. (laughs) And they walk away with everything. Yeah. And that's it. Hijinks ensue. Yeah. There you go. There's like a certain point where I'm like, here's the story. And then after a time, it's like, and then stuff happens. Yeah, totally agree. Well, I mean, I don't know how much farther we can go talking about this movie 
uh, without talking about some of the influences on the movie. Right off the bat, I think it, it's really clear that this movie is super different than the other Wes Andersons we've watched, Brad, both in structure, in rhythm, you know, the pacing of the film. It, it is like a slapdash. It's almost like a uh, a screwball comedy from the 30s and 40s. The dialogue is so rapid fire, and it's never been like that in any of the other Wes Andersons that we've watched for the show. So I think right off the bat, before we even dive any deeper into what the movie's about... It's pretty clear from the jump that this is unique among those movies. Yeah, it's fascinating. As you were saying, screwball comedies, uh, the way that they travel in this movie a lot, it almost made me think of planes, trains and automobiles, <laughs> like with just the weirdness of the the couple, the the main two characters that are paired together as they travel about trying to make it to a place. I don't know. There, there was something there that just clicked in my brain where I was like, oh, yeah, John Candy, Steve Martin. Sure. Patrick, I want to ask you. Yeah, I'm sure you've seen every movie Wes Anderson has done at this point. And I've been trying to kick around yes. this it, cockamamie theory in my mind. But for a long time, my favorite Wes Anderson was Moonrise Kingdom. And, you know, these kind of came out back to back in his filmography. It was Moonrise and then Grand Budapest. And yet I feel like in a lot of ways they're on opposite ends of a spectrum. Like if you could plot Wes Anderson from, uh, you know, on one side, you've got closest to reality or, uh, you know, verisimilitude or whatever you want to call it. His worlds are always constructed, but there is a degree to which <laughs> this the world in this movie is constructed where it's it's literally a dollhouse at many points. And if you put, you know, mm -hmm. reality on one end, uh, you know, and formalism and style on, on the other end, I guess. Which end of the spectrum do you tend to gravitate to most? And do you see this as one of his more, you know, more stylistic, less realistic films? That's a really good question, because this is something that I've given a lot of thought to over the years, uh, because I think his first three movies, so Bottle Rocket, Rushmore, Royal Tenenbaums, um, those are the ones that feel the most like they kind of exist in yes. the real world. Uh, I know you, you mentioned Moonrise Kingdom, which is, uh, I mean, w w we can talk about that. But, uh, but, but, but the first three, like, even though, for instance, like Royal Tenenbaums, it's like they don't. It's the weird thing where it's set in New York City, but they don't say it's set in New York City, mm -hmm. and and they like cover up all the landmarks and make up locations, like the three hundred and seventy fifth Street Y. There is no 375th Street in New York, <laughs> like stuff like that. Uh, and so, but but they still like they're mostly shot uh, on real locations and they just feel a bit more like uh, like they are just a stylized take on our world. Mm -hmm. And I think Life Aquatic, which is, you know, the first one where he got a notably larger budget uh, is like a turning point mm -hmm. in in terms of like that's the one where the dollhouse elements become more pronounced. Like that's where you you first get the cross section view yep. of like one of his locations um, and then and his movies. And from that point onward, kind of I, I think he became more confident in his abilities, but also just gain got more resources so that he could more fully construct the world mm -hmm. uh, and like build it from the ground up. And I think him, uh, I think making Fantastic Mr. Fox, uh, his first of two animated movies, was also, I guess, created a, a bit of a shift in his approach because, you know, he's making a stop motion animated movie. He is fully constructing e literally everything there. Mm -hmm. And if you look at like Grand Budapest, there are just the way it's composed, the like the, the, the use of models and everything feels much closer to an animated movie like mm -hmm. Fantastic Mr. Fox than his previous live action movies. Mm -hmm. And the thing about this is I don't think any of this is necessarily I mean, it's not none of this is a problem. Uh, in many ways, it's a good thing because he's he's just becoming, you know, like more and more fully like who he wants to be. And again, my two favorite Wes Anderson movies are on opposite ends of the spectrum. Yep. There's Rushmore, which mm -hmm. is much more in the real world, even though it's still a very heightened, you know, Wes Anderson world. And then there's Royal Tenenbaum. I mean, sorry, then there's Grand Budapest, which is 
the most dollhousey of all his movies, even more so than like the French Dispatch. Yeah. Uh, this and and the thing is, but this is also a movie about why these like carefully designed like like little dollhouse worlds matter. Yeah. And and that's kind of like like th- this is for me like what makes it such an important movie. Uh, like in in his body of work, because it is basically a movie about why his very specific approach to these things, which some people find annoying. You know, I'll, every time he makes a movie, I always see like a handful of people on Twitter being like, "Oh, he's doing his Wes Anderson thing again." I'm always like, but like literally, no one else is doing a Wes Anderson thing. Like mm-hmm. this is this is his. Like, isn't it great that he has a thing that he does that that isn't really like anybody else? And and you know, then you've got. Grand Budapest here, which is like, oh, here was like this world that was kind of beautiful. That was, uh, you know, run by people who like really cared about their work and 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 like about the fine details and making things beautiful and and why that stuff matters. And then the like wave of ugly fascism rolls in mm-hmm. and like steam rolls all of that. And so, uh, I mean, look, uh, I'm I'm sure you could. Uh, I don't know if this is jumping too far ahead. Is it okay if I if I quote a line oh, from please. like near the end of the movie? Yeah. Um, because I'm 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 trying to pull it up on IMDb to see if I can get the exact line because um there's a line that uh F. Murray Abraham has. Oh yeah. Has we've we've got it marked the, down too. Yep. Oh, oh great. Um but that that feels like kind of like the the mission statement of the whole movie 100 percent. brad do you have it pulled and, up we were just talking about yeah, it. i was gonna say do, is it do you know the one i'm uh, to be frank i think his world had vanished long before he ever entered it but i will say he certainly sustained the illusion with a marvelous grace yes that is it and i mean look i think that applies perfectly to wes anderson himself yep. <laughs> he is he is he basically doing everything he can if you look at like his personal aesthetic as like a human being the way he dresses uh if you look at the type of movies he's trying to make and uh and the type of cinema he's trying to keep alive that's exactly it it's like the the time he's meant to exist was like decades before he was born but with all of his work he's trying to preserve this Mm -hmm. and uh and again this is why i think this is kind of his masterpiece yeah and i I think it's fascinating because in rushmore which is you know his second film i i would say that the anderson analog is the main character of the movie who is viewed as this precocious young playwright who's far ahead of his peers and, you know, just unmatchable. And yet he can't master, you know, some of the basic human interactional skills. And then here in this movie, we have him as a concierge who is trying to hold on to the illusion of the past. And and I wonder if there's there's just some semblance of him putting himself into these roles and how he views himself at these, you know, different stages of his career. This is stuff that I've thought about, and I've also thought about why is it that I respond so so much to these two movies, hmm. these movies about protagonists who are like kind of control freaks who who try to manipulate the world <laughs> around them into being a very specific way. And uh, and yeah, uh, this is a thing that I, I, I have noticed. And um, and and I. Really, that these two as like companion pieces of like, you know, Monsieur Gustav as as kind of like the somewhat older, more mature Max Fisher. That's a mm. that's a take I like. All right, well, let's jump into talking about the performances. Then we've we've kind of been circling around this role of Monsieur Gustav, who's played by Rafe Fiennes, in what might be the best performance of his career. I mean, Brad, we've only really had him on the show a few times with Schindler's List, a wildly different performance, and then as Voldemort, <laughs> which is, again, wildly different than this. So uh, you're missing one, Bob. Oh, what was the other one? Prince of Egypt. Oh, that's as, right. As Ramesses. As Ramesses. Yeah, totally forgot about that one. So, uh, yeah, I guess he's probably been on here like six or seven times now that I think about it. And yet this is definitely <laughs> an outlier among those roles you know, known for his dramatic roles. And here he brings such a 
I don't want to call it a lightness because it's a very high strung performance in a movie that is a very high strung movie. But uh, he has such a, a, a deft touch that I'm surprised he hasn't done more comedy on screen. It's just like it's a beautiful performance. Yeah. The thing with Ray Fiennes is he's an actor that literally everyone agrees upon. Like, I've never heard a single person say, I just don't like that guy. He's like, mm -hmm. he like one of his performances was bad. No one's ever said that. Uh, he's <laughs> he, he's universally agreed upon as really good. Uh, you know, I, I, it also helps come out the gate really strong with Schindler's List. Right. Uh, where That's obviously it's like an all timer, like towering performance. But then, like, you know, when he's like announced playing like Voldemort, everyone was just like, oh, yeah, yep, yep. Yeah, that checks out when I he like joins it. the bond the Bond series, everyone's like, yep, 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 that's that, that that's uh, cool. Like, he's got to be in there eventually. But um, but he is general. And like, you think of, I feel like the, the stuff he's best known for, like, whether those ones are like the English patient are those those types of things. It, he, they're usually pretty serious, the constant gardener. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think in, at least in the past, like, oh, my God, was this like almost 15 years ago? <laughs> uh, in terms of comedy, I think the the big one that that was like a bit of a revelation for a lot of people was in Bruges. Yeah, because yep. specifically just his delivery of the line "You're an inanimate fucking object." <laughs> <laughs> uh, is because he's playing a, a scare. He's playing a, 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 like that. He works so well there because that is a classic scary Ray Fiennes villain role. Mm -hmm. But then he's also very funny. And then, I, I, but then I'll, I'll, I'll you know you, you skip ahead a few years and you've got Hail Caesar. Right. You've got the would that it, would that wait, it were so simple. <laughs> was that the no? That was two years after this, right? I think so. Yeah. So really, so w what we're saying is Martin McDonough was the guy who first kind of made people realize Ray Fiennes could be funny, and then Wes Anderson fully unlocked it mm -hmm. and was like, oh, wait, we've secretly got one of the great comedic actors of our time right here, and you've all been sleeping on him. All we really need at this point is for him to do like the Colin Firth thing and get his Mamma Mia. Like oh that's that's what we need is for him I, to just tilt into full <laughs> musical mode. Wait, wait, wait. Have you seen a bigger splash? I have. Yeah, because he has kind of has a big dance scene. That's true. Uh, where? Yeah. When he he puts on. Uh, oh, oh, uh, emotional rescue by the Rolling Stones, mm -hmm. and just like you know, he, he, his his shirt unbuttoned, like wearing a bathing suit, just like goes off dancing around the room. Yeah. Um, that is, uh, I, I think that is the closest we've come. <laughs> also, great performance uh, in that movie. All right, guys, where do you want to go from here with the performances? Because this cast has, uh, I think I counted, and it's a million people in it. And um, <laughs> they all kind of share similar screen time, except for Tony Revolori, who we will for sure talk about. But I don't know, Brad, who, who stood out to you, aside from Rafe Fiennes, that you'd like to mention here? I mean, I, I think that Willem Dafoe just is playing like the most silent version of the Green Goblin that he can. <laughs> and he's over the top and just ridiculous. And when he when he unbuttons his coat and puts the, the whiskey in the, the perfect little pocket for it, like it's just everything I want out of a Willem Dafoe performance. Yeah, so this is his, I believe, only second Wes Anderson movie because I don't, I don't think he was in the voice cast of Fantastic Mr. Fox, but I always struggle to remember exactly who's in that cast list. And it, I mean, you could not ask for a more crazily different character than, than to be like this vampire fanged assassin who's lurking in the shadows. You know, he made a movie in the early 2000s uh, where he was essentially playing uh, Nosferatu. Now, was he Patrick? Remind me. Remind me. Was he Nosferatu or was he Murnau in that movie? I can't remember. Uh, he was Max Schreck. That's the right. Actor okay. who, played who played Nosferatu. Nosferatu. Right. Who then? I I actually haven't seen this movie. I've uh, seen it. I've only seen it like on cable, or you know what I mean. Like I've caught pieces of it because the other the other actor in that is Malkovich, and I can never remember yeah. who plays who in that movie. He's Murnau. Yeah. Got it. Uh, I, I I mean. He, Here's a question. Has Malkovich played a vampire? 
in a movie? I don't know. Because he should. I mean, <laughs> I think just like take him in Dangerous Liaison, stick a pair of fangs on there and you're good to go. <laughs> well, that, that was going to be my point here, which was like, he, he has this vampire look, which is very reminiscent of that movie for me. And and really reminiscent and again getting back to the influences thing that scene where he's chasing jeff goldblum through the museum and they're doing all of those silent movie in camera transitions and tricks it's so reminiscent of like a fritz lang movie and i Mm -hmm. i really love what they're doing there but you're right brad like he makes wes anderson makes defoe this silent era german expressionist villain and it works perfectly (laughs) Which is kind of one of the things that I think is amazing about this movie, because this is like this is kind of like Wes Anderson's like closest to a a thriller he's made Mm -hmm, and like mm -hmm. an action movie. Like, as you were saying, like uh, earlier, it does obviously like have a a really, really fast, like, like a fast paced, you know, screwball pace and tone and everything. But also, this is the only time he's gotten into real like suspense Mm -hmm. uh almost like horror sequences Mm -hmm. uh he's got like full action scenes i mean i I know there's like a you know there's a little bit of action in uh the life aquatic but but this is like he's got you know like actual proper i guess his version of action scenes this is this is really like him him branching out into some new territory like when has he ever done a scene like that one with defoe stalking goldblum through the museum I mean, he never has. And I think that's part of why it's so effective. And Brad was actually just talking to me about this before we hit record that the violence in this movie, or maybe it was at the beginning of the episode. I can't even remember now, Brad, but the violence in this movie is so startling and it happens in a way that you've really never seen before with Wes Anderson that I think it makes it all the more effective. Yeah, I I think that it feels like most Wes Anderson movies, if there is a fight between male characters it will just inevitably involve slapping like and i don't i don't say that to like I, like that's i feel like that's just his style of comedy right to have two grown men like kind of having a slap fight with one another right. and so to to move from that i don't know feel of violence from his other movies into one where jeff goldblum's four fingers get chopped off which set up what I think one of the funniest uh, punchlines of the movie when they say they could only they couldn't find four fingers on the left hand and they so just got the one fingerprint <laughs> <laughs> for the left hand, <laughs> like it's it's wildly violent and yet still accomplishes the the comedic purposes of the movie. Mm-hmm. And I, I just it's almost like dissonant and yet because it is dissonant, it makes each part stand out mm-hmm. as as more violent and more funny than they would have been on their own. Yeah, I do, I do have to say a, th- a thing that I've always found really interesting with Wes Anderson is that his movies very often have like maybe one isolated violent scene like his movies are not in general violent, mm-hmm. but but which is why moments like uh Richie's suicide attempt in the Royal Tenor Bombs yeah. mm-hmm. uh, are. I mean, oh we God, just watched I, Moonrise and, and the dog gets shot through the neck with an arrow in that movie. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Wes Anderson loves killing dogs. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, which is why he eventually had to atone and make a whole movie about that. Exactly. But, or, or, or like um, uh, Owen Wilson's death in Life Aquatic. Mm-hmm. There's like and, and like parts where blood suddenly appears where like you haven't like you pretty much haven't even seen the color red. And so this sudden arrival of like blood and like real death and violence is always so jarring because it's it's usually so hard to imagine anything like that even happening in these worlds yeah and here he goes a little bit further with it where there a lot more people die (laughs) very much so (laughs) i also simply i also see this movie and, and going back to what you were saying earlier about where this stands kind of in his filmography this is really the start of him playing with genre and playing with form but also playing with like framing devices and it's something that, I mean, really, I think, reaches its pinnacle with French Dispatch, which is uh, not definitely not my favorite Wes Anderson movie, but probably the one that I think you could get the most critical about the structure of. Like, it's it's really fascinating how he puts that movie together. But here it's a story within a story within a story within a story. And you have this really quick setup at the beginning of 
a girl in present day going to visit the gravesite of a famous author. And then they show a shot of the author's like headstone uh, bust and it cuts back to 1985 and shows him as, you know, middle aged uh, Tom Wilkinson and then cuts back from there to the 1960s where he's played by Jude Law and getting told the story of the Grand Budapest Hotel by F. Murray Abraham, who we then go even further back in time and see his character as the lobby boy. And I don't know how much of the framing device is strictly necessary, to be honest, but it's really interesting to see him start to play with some of these quirks that he's going to add into the way he frames his stories. Honestly, it's it's fascinating how in other movies, like, like A Moonrise Kingdom, he's almost trying to capture what it feels like to remember a summer romance as a as a teenager right Mm -hmm. like like the whole movie is set up to feel like a memory whereas this story is almost set up to feel like what it what it is to experience a story fourth or fifth hand It, it kind of reminds me of the story of coco that like if we don't remember the stories of our past as they are told as they're passed down generation to generation then you know what what meaning does our life have does our life have and and i think he does that really beautifully here capturing the idea of a of a story told down from generation to generation mm-hmm. yeah and i think that might be a good place to to kind of jump off into f murray abraham and jude law because they're you know the people that we visit with the most outside of that 1930s world And I really just want to talk about F. Murray Abraham because he is incredible in everything he does and he's not in enough stuff and he's not I don't feel like he's appreciated enough. But uh, first of all, one of the all time great narrating voices, I wish that he would just read to me on a daily basis. (laughs) But also, Brad, this is now the second time that we've had him on the show way back in season one or two. We did Amadeus, his Oscar winning Mm -hmm. role. And that movie is structured very similarly. Like Wes Anderson obviously saw Amadeus and said, this is this is my in to telling this story. I need to have a framing device where old F. Murray Abraham tells me the story of young F. Murray Abraham. (laughs) And uh, I I think he took a, a good note there because it really does help the movie out to have that narration kind of pushing things along. Yeah. And it's also I'm trying to figure out how to articulate this because. I, I do think that I hate to say like all all of the framing devices are like absolutely necessary, but I I think they do all add something to the movie because, again, if this, you know, if this movie is kind of like, uh, you know, an a, a celebration of, of this this kind of like way of life that uh that is now gone you've now have like the the ripple effects through to the present of like people are still like e- even just like the in the girl reading the book people are still like benefiting from like monsieur gustav's approach to things even if it's only through like the story about him mm-hmm. uh and and to show that they're like oh th- these will still like this will still last in some way but the the thing that i think is so interesting about the f murray abraham narration is that you know was anderson's movies they tend to be the characters are emotionally reserved but they're also all movies where people are like frequently dealing with like profound loss and grief and mm-hmm. stuff like that they're mm-hmm. just you know not <laughs> they don't tend to be like talking very openly about their feelings right and and so having those scenes where like you know f marie abraham starts like breaking down like at at dinner like thinking about agatha and but then like not wanting to mm. get really into it and then the thing is like Pretty much like all of like the, the parts of the story that she's in are mostly just the ways that she connects to like getting Monsieur Gustav out of prison. And he kind of skims over like much of this like very serious romance that they mm-hmm. had mm-hmm. because he doesn't want to get into it. And and just that thing of of like you have this, you know, having this this storyteller who is you know clearly like skimming over certain things he doesn't want to get into because they're a little bit too painful for him i think adds so much mm-hmm. to a movie that is again about like all this stuff that has been lost so yeah it's yeah, good I, I think that the, the the story of agatha is like the most grounding element of this movie 
where like, uh, you know, we, we were talking about how it's a story within a story within a story. But you kind of see that in the way it's told. A lot of things are exaggerated and ridiculous. And, and you know, it's a it's a storybook type of uh, type of tale. And so he tells it as if it's a storybook. Whereas with Agatha, there's no, you know, heroic death for her. There, there's nothing that happens in the story. The, the thing that makes this story feel real coming from F. Murray Abraham is the fact that he, he finishes it and just says, yeah, like she died a few years later in childbirth and we're not going to talk about that because that's the most painful moment of my life. And, and it just it just gives the whole movie a sense of like, oh, yes, it was kind of ridiculous what we told, but it, it still was set in a very real world. Film and Whiskey Nation, do you ever think about awards? Of course you do. You drink whiskey and watch movies, which means that you know that nothing is validated until a group of random people say, hey, we love what you're doing. The awesome thing about Doc Swinson's whiskey is that it isn't just some group of schlubs that are giving them awards. They have been winning attention from some of the most important whiskey experts that you can imagine. They've been voted best distillery in Washington state by the New York International Spirits Competition. They've been voted the best independent bottler by the Ascot Awards, as well as the best finished bourbon from the Ascot Awards for their La Menta Exploratory Cask. Their Exploratory Cask series is where they release some of the most fascinating and adventurous experiments. If you're ever checking out Doc's lineup and see a white label, there's a really good chance that that's the only time you'll see that bottle, so make sure you snatch it up. Doc Swinson's has been offering just phenomenal finished and blended whiskeys for quite some time now. You can find them online at docswhiskey.com. That's D-O-C-S whiskey.com. All right, let's do some rapid fire <laughs> evaluation of the other performances here. I mean, I, I think I wrote down like four or five other people, but we could go on and on and on. I guess I'll start. I think Adrian Brody in this movie is just uh, the man is dialing it up <laughs> to 100 and also knocking it out of the park. I really like watching Adrian Brody in Wes Anderson movies because the performance is very, uh, you know, drastically from movie to movie. I think he's great in Darjeeling Limited. I think he's great here. I do think it would be interesting as I watched the movie, I thought to myself, I wonder what it would have been like if he and Edward Norton had swapped roles, because I think mm. they both could have pulled off the other person's role pretty convincingly. But at the end of the day, uh, I really, really liked what Brody was doing here. These days is is what's interesting, like the only person who's figured out how to use Adrian Brody well in the last like 15 years. I think so. And and I've been really fascinated with the trajectory of his career. And, and you know, it's one of those things where if you don't know what happened behind the scenes with certain actors, you just kind of as a as a moviegoer are left scratching your head. And with Adrian Brody, I'm sure there's a number of things. But that clip of him on SNL that has surfaced over the last couple of years of him doing the Rastafarian thing, uh, I think that's the moment where where Hollywood was like, yeah, not so much on this guy anymore. And, and then <laughs> yeah. Wes Anderson goes, you know what? No, I can still I can still make something beautiful out of out of this man. And he has right. consistently. Yeah, I mean, the the thing with Brody is it's just like th there is that. I mean, there's a I don't know if you've read uh, Tina Fey's memoir, but there's a whole section talking about you know dealing with Adrian Brody and his insistence on doing the Rastafarian accent because he <laughs> thought it was the funniest thing in the world, and everyone tried to stop him. Um, but I uh, but I mean, the, the, there's things like that. But then also just like the roles he would choose. I'm like uh, other you know. Occasionally, there's something where like, OK, yeah, d doing like the Peter Jackson King Kong. Yeah, I, that that makes sense. But uh, but so much of his other choices are just baffling. And so I'm glad that Wes Anderson also once again unlocked. Oh, this guy can be really funny. Like in this movie, just the way that pretty much all the profanity in this movie is really funny. Be like because like, you know, Monsieur Gustav is so refined all the time. And then. Anytime he swears or says something crude, it it feels so it feels like so off coming from him and is always funny. But yeah. the way the way that Adrian Brody shouts like, what is this shit? is always it's always like having him just be the like the cr most immediately crude person in the film is hilarious. And I feel like between like this and Moonrise Kingdom, Ed Norton has kind of 
gotten this, I, this like I guess place in the Wes Anderson movies as just sort of like as a kind of a gentle, reassuring figure. Yeah. Even here when he's like this, you know, the good, uh, the good military, Nazi. Yeah, the the, the good <laughs> Nazi. But it, but it's still just like he's like Ed Norton. You've got a you've got a nice relaxing voice, and you seem like a good guy, and you're gonna play that kind of person, even though I know you can do all sorts of other stuff. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's weird. It's weird that he's kind of gotten pigeonholed as that guy, because, you know, again, if you're if you think about early Ed Norton, if you think about Fight Club or Primal Fear or American History X, uh, I feel like the roles that Ed Norton has taken on in the last 10 years kind of all tip into that. Like, hey, I'm going to do the Matt Damon thing for a while. And that's kind <laughs> of that's kind of the role he plays here. The answer here is that Wes Anderson is a huge fan of keeping the faith. That's and it. he just wants him to like be in that <laughs> zone all the time. Yeah, right. I was gonna say we we see him as the face of fascism here. He's also been the face of anarchy. So I I just don't know if you you ever know what you're gonna get with Edward Norton. All right, maybe let's do it this way because we have to break for the whiskey soon. Brad and Patrick, uh, let's pick one other person and and talk about what you liked about their performances. Can I just talk about Tony Revolori? Oh, go for it. Because dude, I mean it's. It's such a rare pleasure in in movies to to have an and introducing credit for someone who is basically the lead of the mm -hmm. movie. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, they discovered an unknown and they're great. He's just I mean, Zero is not as showy a role as Monsieur Gustav, but he's just just he's just such a joy to watch in in every scene like like. He's a, such an interesting looking guy, especially with his like drawn on pencil mustache mm -hmm. and and just the way he moves uh, his just the, like his facial expressions as he just like listens with his eyes wide to the rapid fire directions that Ray Fiennes is giving him. I mean, he's he's kind of like the heart of the movie. And I was like, I remember watching this for the first time, like in theaters being like, who is this guy? Yeah. And. What, what will he do next? And I was thrilled when he ended up in the Spider-Man movies. Mm -hmm. I was like, great, great. Put him in all the stuff. He's he's he's, he's the best. Yeah. yeah, he he just has an ability to constantly learn from Monsieur Gustave that that is just captivating. And the one time he always stands up for himself is when it comes to Agatha. And, and once again, it just gives this this it grounds him as a character that he's not just simply, you know, following Gustav's every lead. He like he stands up for himself when it's something he really cares about. And and just the way that Revelory says, don't flirt with her. <laughs> Was he flirting with you? I, I just it just kills me every time, man. Brad, what did you think of Saoirse Ronan? Because you've brought her up a couple times now. So, dude, if I feel like if there is a victim of the storytelling device, which is I don't want to talk about Agatha. It's the fact that we don't see Saoirse Ronan <laughs> enough in this movie. And, and she should be in more of every movie that she's in. Yeah. I like, mean, she, she she she's like 30 years old and I think she has four Oscar nominations now. I, like it's kind of mind boggling how good she's been for so long and she's still so young yeah there there's a a tenacity and a sincerity to her performance here that i just i just can't get over i i, I use that word sparingly but it, it's usually one of my favorite ways to say i really like a performance is to say it was sincere and there's just something about the way she goes about her craft, whether it's making the little cakes with the the, the tiny little Wes Anderson hammers uh, in them uh, or the way that she fights with Zero as she's like, I, I'm not going to be a fence that I just love her in this movie. Yeah, because she kind of has the, the tough role where it's like, as we've already established, probably a lot like. Mustafa, so present day or not even present day, 1960s uh, mm -hmm. Zero, old Zero, is deliberately skipping over the meatier parts of her story. Uh, so like, I, you know, those scenes are just not present. That would probably give her a lot more to do. Mm -hmm. And so she kind of has to be be both like his idealized version of her because this is being told through his perspective, but then also seem to have an interior life. And also like, you know, again, tenacity is, is, is a good word because you also have to believe like 
why she's, you know, risking her life doing these things uh, for reasons other than that she is hopelessly in love and going along with just whatever stupid plans. And uh, and she has to seem like she, she, she manages to build so much of like so much interiority and make this person feel like a real person who like and you understand why she's doing these things and taking these risks uh, when probably when not a ton of it is on the page. Um, so uh, here's a scorching hot take. Uh, Saoirse Ronan good at acting <laughs> I, an enjoyable screen presence who we are always happy to see absolutely <laughs> well before we get to whiskey any thoughts on the mainstays murray schwartzman i mean that the montage of the with the society of the crossed keys where it's oh. just everyone's just popping up it's it's yep. just a delight it's like it's one of those things where you're just like man i'm having the time of my life this movie can't get any better and then he makes a phone call and then yeah. you just get all of the, I mean, yeah. and then also just, it's a great to see everyone show up, uh, but then also just the gags of every person, like their lobby boy comes over, they, uh, they give them the message, they say, you take over, like the, the one on the guy, <laughs> like doing CPR on the tennis court is, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I mean, again, this, this is what you get into Wes Anderson movie, they don't get in anything else, it is that like, Every little throwaway like shot for a mm -hmm. few seconds yep. is going to be in a it's going to have an entire story like uh, like a whole like mini movie within this yeah. like five second shot. Yeah, it, it almost feels like a family guy like chicken fight scene like it just right. keeps going and getting bigger and more ridiculous. And I'm I'm here for all of it. Uh, I, I also think that I just feel like Wes Anderson Every time he has, you know, Bill Murray and Jason Schwartzman in his movies, I feel like he has to write them like a handwritten, perfect calligraphy letter that's like, Dear Mr. William J. Murray, I would invite you to perform in my <laughs> upcoming picture. And like just just this really long letter that he writes to them because there's no other way he would invite them to be in his movies. Yeah, but on the, on no, the other like on the other hand, can you think of a better way to spend a day on set? Like, you know, the food's yeah. going to be good. You know, everything's going to be neat and in order. <laughs> and he's like, all right, Harvey Keitel, I have written you three lines of dialogue. I would like you to sit here <laughs> and rhythmically flex your pecs and biceps as you say these three lines. And then you can go home. And, like, and then slap the shit out of Tony <laughs> Revolori. <laughs> okay. W one thing that I do want to mention here, because the, the entire prison sequence is just so good. Oh. But the way that uh, they like they never let you forget that these that these nice men that Monsieur Gustav has has befriended are all like hardened killers. <laughs> and, like, yes. the, the, the point when when, when the, the guys are leaving and they they run off to the bus and you think they're just catching the bus and then it just cuts <laughs> back to like a wide shot as they are like choking and killing the bus driver right. to steal the bus. <laughs> or like the moment when you know they, they were they're almost out of the prison and they like pull up the the uh, like the train trap door and then see oh no the guards are on there playing cards and one guy without thinking twice whips out a knife and just l drops down there and f fight stabs them all to death and finally dies himself and it's just like it's it, like this is like you know uh, a whimsical wes anderson movie in like this dollhouse world and it's all very funny and and also death and murder is everywhere <laughs> all over 100 percent all right, guys, I think this is a good place for us to take a break. Brad, we have a bourbon to try, so let's get to this Russell's Reserve Single Barrel. What do you say? Let's get to it. Today's sponsor is a little bit of a departure from our usual area of expertise, and man, oh man, I was blown away by their product once we received it. I am talking about Manscaped. Now, if you're like me at all, you've probably seen the Manscaped ads and kind of wondered to yourself, like, do I really need like some sort of specialty trimmer to take care of my downstairs business? And I've just got to be honest, I was absolutely wrong. Uh, their trimmer is called the Lawnmower 4.0, and I got to say, it is the Rolls Royce of trimmers. It's got a ceramic blade that reduces grooming mishaps, a wireless charging base, and an awesome flashlight that keeps things illuminated while you're working. And beyond all that, it's waterproof. This thing is really changing the game when it comes to below the belt hygiene. Now, this is just me talking about my experience, but this trimmer really is way beyond anything I've ever used to keep things neat and tidy. 
you can use our discount code film whiskey to get 20% off your order and free shipping. Head on over to manscaped.com and use code film whiskey to get 20% off free shipping and you will be well on your way to hygiene heaven. All right, so today we are checking out Russell's Reserve Single Barrel. Now, Russell's Reserve is the brainchild of Jimmy and Eddie Russell from Wild Turkey. It is one of their higher end products, you know, kind of alongside Rare Breed, usually actually a bit more pricey. They make a bourbon and a rye. We're trying the single barrel today, which is always bottled at 110 proof, Brad. So it's not necessarily you know, barrel proof because that would fluctuate wildly. They always consistently put it out at 110, but wild turkey is always put in the barrel at a relatively low proof, like somewhere between 107 and 114, somewhere in there. So it's not like they're watering it down a ton. What's in the bottle is usually about eight years old, and that's actually what we have here today. So this barrel is from our friend Austin at the Bourboneering Podcast, who's given us a sample from a barrel that was distilled back in 2011 and bottled in 2020. The mash bill on this bad boy is the same as all wild turkeys, uh, 75% corn, 13% rye, 12% malted barley. Those are the specs. Let's get drinking. Brad, what are you picking up on the nose here? Oh, what was that, Bob? I, I heard you say rare breed, and I've just been been thinking about <laughs> how phenomenal how, rare how good is rare since. breeds, dude. It's just crazy how affordable and spectacular that whiskey is. Uh, mm. Well, I'm telling you what, man. I'm actually nosing this right now <laughs> on the air. I know you've you've had it already. Mm-hmm. This is like right up there in terms of dude. Phenomenal noses. Like, there's a ton of oak here. But it's peanut butter, it's caramel, mm-hmm. there's leather, there's pepper. I mean, it's just like everything you want in a bourbon that you also know is going to put some hair on your chest. Yeah, I, I think that there's caramel, there's vanilla. For me, there was almost like an orange creamsicle mm-hmm. thing going on. Uh, like like it's not it's not citrusy, but it's like creamy orange. I, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And then there's like this at the back. You're right. There's a lot of peanut butter going on. But at the back end, there's just that little hint of that 13 percent rye that makes me like just I I just get really excited. So, yeah, I am a big fan of the nose here. I'm going to give it an eight and a half. I'm going to give it a nine. I really, really like this and I'm excited to take a sip. So I'm going to ask that you share your tasting notes while I sip this. Yeah, I mean, this is like a peanut butter cheesecake from uh, the Cheesecake Factory. Like there, there's all sorts of peanut notes. Um, there's caramel, there's vanilla. And then kind of on the back end of the palate, once it hits the back of your tongue, you just get a little bit of that spiciness going on, kind of a, a rye baking spice feel to it that is is complex and, and just really, really beautiful. Uh, for me, it came down a little bit from the nose but not very far. I'll still give it an 8 out of 10 on the taste. I'm going to stick it a 9, man. This thing is really blowing me away so far. It's it's kind of thin, but it's thin because it's so alcohol forward. You know what I'm talking about? Like when you can really taste the alcohol, mm-hmm. the way that presents yeah. on your palate is, is almost more thin. It does coat the palate, but it's not a really viscous, oily whiskey. Uh, and in fact, like it's it's pretty strong, man. Like there's there's a ton of yeah. uh, of tingle here going on. It's not astringent and it's not like harsh. It's just that the alcohol in this would make me think that we were drinking something that's like between 120 and 130 proof, not 110. So like be prepared for this product to kind of knock you on your butt a little bit. But man, the flavors, it's it's vanilla and caramel up front. There's a little bit of oak on the mid palate. And you're right. When you go to swallow, it's just like waves and waves of peanut. Super good. Uh, Just a classic bourbon palate. I'm giving it a nine out of 10. Yeah. And I think the finish, like you said, it 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 rounds itself out with all sorts of peanut butter. Uh, The orange creamsicle really sticks around to the end. And then the oak comes through, but it doesn't get bitter. It doesn't get anything funky going on. It's just a really well-rounded whiskey. Uh, I think I'll give it an eight and a half on the finish. Yeah, I'm going to come down a bit too. There are just, there's just this one little flavor at the very back of the palate after you swallow. And I don't know if it's just oak. 
um, or if it's some of that barley that's coming through, there's just a little bit of a funk here that turns slightly bitter. And that's the only thing that's really taking this down a peg for me. I'm going to give it an eight on the finish. Yeah. And overall, the balance, I will say this is like a semi-complex whiskey. It's not like over the top with tons of different flavors that all work together. Uh, but overall, it's a really solid experience. And all of the notes that you get throughout just blend together really nicely. I'll, I'll give it an eight out of 10 on balance. Yeah, I think I'm going to give it a nine again. I mean, the finish was a slight step down. But this is a very consistent whiskey. Like from the time I nosed it, I knew it was going to have some power behind it. And it totally did. Uh, there's a ton of oak. There's a ton of alcohol on this. And it's just a really, really good Kentucky bourbon. Like, uh, is it is it like mind blowingly complex? No, not really. But that's kind of what we like about Rare Breed as well. This is just mm -hmm. it seems like an even more potent version of Rare Breed. And I really like that. So it's a nine for me on the balance. And with value, Bob, I, I guess I'm curious. I This is a single barrel that was bought at Alexander's Market down in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So I don't I don't really know. How are we going to score value here? Yeah, I mean, like we're, we're obviously rating the one barrel that we've had. And that's the danger of single barrels is that they're not blended with anything else. So the consistency from barrel to barrel can be slightly off. Now, again, like they're they're charring the barrels the same. It's the same mash bill. But hey, if if our barrel came from a higher floor in the Rick House than yours did, or if it came from a hotter part of the Rick House, like it could have a very different flavor profile. So this is priced at $60 a bottle on average, which I think is a really, really decent value. Again, I don't like that they're bottling it at the same proof. If it's going to be a single barrel, I think you really need to let the barrel determine the proof. Um, because it's like at that point, why are you shooting for consistency for things that are inherently inconsistent? And so that's kind of like the only thing I would ding here. But I think the proof is high enough, right? Like it's definitely uh, you can tell that it's 110 proof. I think it's a really good value, Brad. Is it worth the 10 to 12 extra dollars from Rare Breed? Maybe not, but it's also not a bad value. So I'm going to give it an eight out of 10 on value. Yeah, I think if we're using $60 as kind of the benchmark for where you would buy this at, I think that's a pretty solid value. Uh, I'll give it a seven and a half out of 10. I am coming out to maybe my highest score of the season so far. I'm at a 43 out of 50 on this, Brad. Yeah, I'm at a 40.5. So we're we're both coming out above the 40 out of 50 mark, which is the sign of a genuinely good whiskey on this podcast. Yeah, not just good, great. I mean, we're at an 83 and a half out of 100 or a 41.75 out of 50. Generally around that 35 out of 50 mark is where we start recommending and anything over a 40 is like an automatic, you need to get this. I would say uh, it's worth trying at the bar because it's still affordable enough that you're probably paying between 10 to $13 for a pour of it. But uh, it's also worth picking up a bottle. $60 is, is, you know, a chunk of change, but it's also not like exorbitant. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's, yeah. Hey, I want something nice to put on my shelf. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's also not going to break the bank. So uh, for me, it's a no brainer. Try and buy. Yeah. hundred percent. I am right there with you, Bob. Well, we really seem to be <laughs> enjoying this whiskey and I know we both enjoyed this movie. So let's get back to talking with Patrick about the Grand Budapest Hotel. Bob, this is just the best, man. Uh, let's get back to it. All right, everybody. That was Russell's Reserve Single Barrel. Thank you so much to our friend of show, Austin, with the Bourbon Earring Podcast. Man, that was a killer bourbon, Bob. I really yeah. enjoyed it. Uh, again, going along with Patrick's spicy takes, wild turkey makes good whiskey. That, it's it's Who'd crazy, man. It? I would have never yeah. expected. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I think it's time for Patrick to get introduced to one of our newer segments, and it is called Two Facts and a Falsehood. This is the part of the podcast where Brad presents three items to me, all of them as fact. But, uh, you know, in actuality, one of them is completely made up. Brad, I'm doing OK on the season so far, especially given your somewhat nitpicky tendencies in writing these things. I think I'm I'm six and six on the year so far. By nitpicky, I just take careful 
consideration as I craft each and every. What, what was the word we used about Wes Anderson? Fastidious. You are you are fastidious, fastidious in, yeah. in the way that you construct these. All right, I think that what we're going to do today is we have to work Patrick into this somehow, Brad. So, what are you thinking? I think that you have a choice, Bob. Okay, you can either answer this question on your own and get two victories if you get it right. Or you can call Patrick, phone a friend, if you will. And if he helps you get the correct answer, boom, you get your normal victory. However, if he steers you wrong, you you ask him for help and you get it wrong. I think it's worth two losses, in my opinion. I agree. So it's it's either uh, two victories and one loss or one victory and two losses. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well. We'll see how I feel about Patrick Willems here in, in a couple minutes. But Brad, hit, <laughs> hit us with your three facts. All right. Fact number one, the the tattoo on Ludwig uh, are a direct copy of the character of Père Jules in La Atal- Atalante from 1934. The M.A.V. tattooed on his left arm is the abbreviation of the French saying Mort à Vache, which translates to death to cows. Vache being a street slang for cops or policemen. Fact number two, the name of the fictional con- country of Zubroka, Zubrowka, uh, is based yeah. on a Hungarian spirits company that produces gin, which is Wes Anderson's favorite type of liquor. Okay. Fact number three, the soundtrack features a rare instrument, the balalaika, which mm-hmm. is a three-stringed triangular-shaped Russian folk instrument that was carefully chosen by Wes Anderson. All right, Patrick, I, I'm immediately going to come to you for help. So uh, these are harder than I, than I expected. Them these, to be. these are hard, right? <laughs> All right. I'll say this. I know for a fact that there are balalaikas in this soundtrack. So number three is true. OK. And Patrick, it again, you've been on the show three times now, but Brad has not seen a ton of classic films. And I would be shocked if he invented a reference to a Jean Vigo film from the 1930s with fact number one. Mm-hmm. So like I'm, I'm leaning towards number one also being true unless he's being really nitpicky and like the, the more devash or whatever is not a reference to cows or pigs. Right. And but, so wait, so this is a thing that the uh, Harvey Keitel's tattoos uh, yeah. is a reference to La Talante. That, yes. Yeah, that's what he's saying. Okay, I th- I think I watched La Talante uh, like freshman year of college and remember nothing. Love I it. watched <laughs> the first 15 minutes of it one night on HBO Max and oh. I fell asleep and uh, never picked it back up. It's only like an hour and a half long. I should finish it sometime. Some kind of cinephile you are, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then number two, Brad, was about what again? Uh, the name of the country for oh, the yeah, movie. Oh, yeah, Zubravka is uh, based off of a Hungarian company that makes gin. I don't know of any Hungarian gins, but I mean, I'm not I'm not debating that. It sounds very Hungarian. Also, this is I'm going to stop talking now because uh, you, you you know, you still have can potentially get two wins here. So you haven't called me yet. That's true. Now, if listen, if we're going to go down with the ship here, we're doing it together. Patrick. So uh, what what are you thinking? Which sounds the most made up to you? Are you officially calling me in? Oh, I'm calling phoning, you in. F- yeah. F- phoning me, your friend. Absolutely. Um, You know, I'm also leaning toward the gin one. Uh, I'm I'm like, this might be a thing where it's like, oh, it, it maybe it's just a, a different kind of alcohol or something like that. I, I'm also... I, it, w- would Wes Anderson be a gin guy? I don't know. Um, but uh, I'm, I, I'm. that's what I'm leaning toward. All right. So it sounds like we're both leaning towards two. The caveat being, if Brad changed a very minute detail in one or three, maybe the balalaika <laughs> has more than three strings. I don't know. I just know. I just know that when I was looking Bob, at I... things about the score, it said balalaikas. And I was like, oh, cool. All right. I will say I am doing my best to not be nitpicky. All right. So Patrick and I are going to both lock in number two as the falsehood. Bob, Patrick, you are both 100 percent correct. Well done. Yes, we did it. 
I, I was worried about the the La Atalant. I was like, man, Patrick is uh, is pretty well versed. He he probably will know that that's true. But the fact that you knew the Balalaika that that really put it down and made it an easy choice. I think. All right, so I get one victory for that. So I'm seven and six on the season now. I'm back above five hundred thanks to Patrick. Uh, and I think this balalaika thing is actually a great segue into talking a little bit more about some of the behind the scenes stuff here or the the non acting parts of this film. This movie's score is just delightful. I mean, probably the best score we've had in a Wes Anderson movie to this point, Brad. And, you know, Moonrise Kingdom had a pretty good one, but I think this one just takes it to the next level. Yeah, this this one is absolutely incredible. And the fact that you know, we talked earlier about the pacing of this movie and this movie just moves that like there is no slowing down from start to finish. And really, a, a large part of that is the soundtrack there. There's uh, there's just an impatience to the way that this this soundtrack moves throughout the movie. And it really matches the main character of Gustav that he is always so fast paced. He's always uh, just an incredible orator that's that is speaking so incredibly fast. Bob, you mentioned before we got on that you like almost have to watch this movie with subtitles, and and I would agree with you because Ray Fiennes delivers so many funny lines in this movie so quickly mm-hmm. that it's hard to keep up with, and and yet the music keeps up with it and propels you along throughout just beautifully. One of my favorite moments in the score, and I feel like the whole second half of the movie is almost the same theme over and over. And it's got this this really percussive like behind the whole thing. And it reminds me of like all of the praise that we've heaped on like Hans Zimmer over the years for making, uh, you know, like the Dunkirk soundtrack have this ticking clock thing going on. But this is doing the same thing. It's it's about this guy, Monsieur Gustave, who is racing against the clock, but who is also, you know, fastidious and on time all the time. But my favorite little moment is when they are on those two ski lifts and they're they're transferring between one and the other and the ski lifts <laughs> stop and the creaking of the ski lift as it like goes back and forth is timed to the beat of the soundtrack. And mm-hmm. it's again, it's one of these Wes Anderson things where you're like, of course, you would think of that with the sound design. But it just again, it it does such an incredible job of making this dollhouse world feel like a thing that could really exist. Yeah, I mean, the the timing of it, it almost has a bit of a baby driver feel, uh, a little bit of Edgar Wright action that the the way the the action is moving forward, the sound just perfectly punctuates each and every beat of the scene. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bob, I'm with you, man. I, I think that he does a really masterful job of that here. Yeah, like there'll always be a small part of me that misses the the soundtracks of early Wes Anderson mm-hmm. where Mark Mothersbaugh did, did the scores and then they were like full of great needle drops. Yep. And uh, but at the same time, I look at this and I, I listen to this and like, you know, Alexander Desplat's scores for all his movies. I'm like, I can't really argue with this like this is it's so good and uh, also like the thing is one of the first things i always think of when it comes to like the music in uh grand budapest is just the uh like the the kind of the very eastern european kind of like vocal like slow vocal music yep. like that uh, th- that i feel like it you know the movie introduces us to to uh this world with like can, can bef- you sing an example for us patrick no Just real quick. uh no <laughs> i can't um uh, i don't i here because i could not do an accurate representation of it and i do not want to get the really embarrassing recording of me trying <laughs> out into the world uh so i'm not falling for you your tricks yeah I, I will not fall into that <laughs> trap um but uh but yeah but but it, it is like it almost is like the, the the music is slower and more peaceful and then when we're introduced to mr gustav then all the music kind of like like matches his tempo mm-hmm. and it, and is all this like you know it, it's all quickly paced and because this is a chase movie mm-hmm. basically Yeah. And again, going back to the idea of all of the references that are just this movie is chock full of. 
I was I've been reading this book about Wes Anderson uh, by the critic Ian Nathan, and it's really, really good. And he talks throughout the movie about some of the the influences on Wes Anderson that have been present in all his movies and how Charles Schultz's Peanuts is especially in his early films like this, this very kind of mopey youth and this this every character has this sense of ennui that's not so present here, but I think some of the more silly elements that are influences on Wes Anderson really come out here. And I noticed it especially in that scene at the monastery when you finally go inside and all of the monks are singing because it's it is essentially a nod to the monks in Monty Python and the Holy Grail. And there is <laughs> there is so much Monty Python in this movie in the way that he does these cutaways to little miniatures. And when, you know, when they're doing these elaborate jumps off of, you know, ski jumps and it cuts to like a doll just like falling off of the thing. <laughs> and it looks so fake, but it also it, it like undercuts again, this dollhouse thing. It's just so reminiscent of some of the sillier, low budget cutaways that you had in Monty Python. And I love that he's embracing some of that here. Yeah. And, and I've got to say, it takes a lot of confidence uh, for a filmmaker to do this move of of cutting to a what's clearly a doll f- <laughs> for this wide shot of like going off a ski jump. And and I, I, I like that. It's moments like that that really communicate to me like man this guy has like fully mastered what he's doing but because he knows that the live action world of the movie will also be such a a perfect meticulous dollhouse that cutting to an actual doll will still fit aesthetically with everything else around it Mm -hmm. and uh i mean you look at those like those great shots of whether it's Willem Dafoe on the motorcycle or uh, <laughs> Zero and Gustav on the sled with just like, you know, the camera locked on there. And it's one of those things where it's like it's funny. People, you know, are, are always like, oh, you know, Wes Anderson, never a person who uses visual effects. And it's like, no, <laughs> no, uh, they're shot on a green screen. Yeah. Um, he has figured out how to how to incorporate visual effects into his you know, w- way of working uh, to to not just continue the like very handmade aesthetic uh, that he's had f- since the very beginning, but to actually like build upon it. And uh, and it's beautiful. I, I, I really love it. I want to talk a little bit about Robert Yeoman's cinematography here, because he kind of grew up with Wes Anderson as a movie maker. I think he's done eight Wes Anderson movies now. He is not the DP, I believe, on either of the uh, the animated films, but he's pretty much done all of the live action ones. And it's really a- a- every single one. Yeah. right? And it's really cool to see, you know, from Bottle Rocket to now we talk about Wes Anderson's growth in terms of stylistic independence and, and control. But to see what Robert Yeoman's doing, even from like Tenenbaums, where you first start to get that aesthetic and, and rush more a little bit. To Moonrise Kingdom, where everything kind of has this yellowish, Brad, you even commented on it, like a, a, almost a sepia tone to evoke nostalgia. And then you go into Grand Budapest and it's like, let's do everything. Let's have half the movie be <laughs> in like super Panavision. And then the other half of the movie is going to be an Academy ratio. And I don't think this movie gets enough credit for kind of re kickstarting the Academy ratio craze that we now see with like. Every A24 movie that comes out, it it really was way, way ahead of the curve in bringing back some of these. But it also has a purpose in how they're telling the story. Yeah, I remember uh, when I went to see this in a theater when it first came out, that there was a sign on the door to go into the theater saying this movie changes aspect ratios. It is not a mistake. It is a deliberate choice by the filmmakers. <laughs> I think because back then, like there were not movies in the Academy ratio being released in theaters. No. So uh, that, to the point. Yeah. And so it, it like Yeoman is so interesting because obviously he shoots every Wes Anderson movie, which get visually like more ambitious and uh, and more. I, I'm hesitant to say experimental because I don't want it to sound like, oh, they're just like trying shit out. Yeah. But but like, you know, they're like 
with pretty much each one of these movies, they, they're trying to like do some sort of new thing. Even like uh, Moonrise Kingdom, it's all shot on sixteen millimeter, and uh, but they're, they're obviously like pushing in, in new directions and and doing really exciting stylistic things. And almost no one else else asks Yeoman to do that. Like he he was Paul Feig's guy for a long time. Mm-hmm. Shot a lot of, of of Paul Feig comedies. Uh, he shot Mamma Mia, Here We Go Again. There a great go. film there um, <laughs> where where I do think in some of the musical numbers there, especially the Waterloo sequence with it's like really, really careful, precise choreography mm-hmm. uh, and like background gags. I'm like, oh, I can see the crossover from like working on Wes Anderson to doing this. But in general, I'm I'm, I'm just like his Wes Anderson, like his work is always good, but his Wes Anderson work is so different than everything else he does. I'm just surprised that more people aren't getting him to, to, to like, like I guess, to, like to stretch his muscles in in these kinds of ways. Well, and again, he loses he loses the Oscar this year for cinematography, uh, and this movie loses a ton of Oscars to Birdman, which I, I feel like people have done a 180 on. When it came out, everyone loved Birdman, and then within a couple of years, everyone was like, "We're all out on Inuritu, and we don't like this anymore." I'm not say, there. I I was not huge on Birdman from oh. the very beginning. All right. Well, okay. I, I, I've I've never been an Inuritu guy. I uh, I he he's just not really my vibe. And yeah, I, I still watch his movies when they come out, uh, but I I don't tend to enjoy them very much. So, I mean, I'm a fan of Birdman. I think it's a good movie. And the Emmanuel Lubezki thing, he was doing something that for him was another leap forward. And I understand why they gave him the Oscar. But going back now and looking at what Yeoman did here, I think this this should have been his year. Right. I mean, Birdman was always going to win that. It's like in the same way 1917 was always going to win. Whereas it's, it's like, oh, if you do like such a notable, obvious, like d- difficult to pull off stylistic thing that even someone who knows nothing about cinematography can still recognize, you're going to you're going to win it. Yeah, for sure. It's like if if you do a one take movie, you've you've got it. It's in the bag. <laughs> um, it's like so. So yes, I, 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 I mean, like I, I'm not trying to like discount Lubeski's work because he's very good at what he does. Uh, he's actually I, I I I wish he'd do more work with people other than in reach. Actually, I, I was about to say that, but like Lubeski shot the new uh, David O. Russell movie. Oh, the one that's coming out this year. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, what is it like, Amsterdam? Yeah, something like that. The one, the one that Taylor Swift is in. Yes. Um. Yeah. I I I saw the trailer and I was like, who shot this? And because uh, I was I was like, usually Russell's movies are shot by uh, Linus Sandgren, and he's busy these days. Huh. So, uh, but yeah, but it, in general, look, I'm not. I'm, Lubezki does very good work on Birdman, even though even if I personally think that movie would be better if it were not a one shot. Mm-hmm. Um. Uh. But I I feel like, you know, 50 years from now, we're peop- the one people will be talking about is Grand Budapest because and th- th- this work is like is unreal and, and so wildly different from every other movie being made these days. Well, and, and thinking about the cinematography, talk a little bit about what effect it has on a movie when you switch, you know, the aspect ratios the way they do. And, you know, for those unenlightened folks out there, definitely not me, uh, explain Academy of Ratio and how it how it started, how it fell out of fashion, apparently. Uh, I mean, I know all of this myself, but uh, so, give, so, give us a little so, breakdown of that. So I just have to, you know, give you a, uh, a film history lesson here. Yes. For free. Um, OK, so I'll, I'll do this as quickly as I can. Uh, so when films started out, they were all shot in a, a square. Uh, like most of Grand Budapest is, uh, and that and that was it. That's how movies looked, and um, and then and then it became later called the Academy Ratio, and really the the shift started happening with the advent of television, which was also a square when uh and Hollywood was panicking because they're like, oh no, are people just going to stop going to the movies and only watch TV instead? We need to start. Doing more things to, uh, to like you know s- separate uh, movies from TV, and one of those things could be: what if we had a, a wider p- 
picture that 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 had that you know just like more going on. You could see like a big wide landscape, and it and it, and it more reflected, I guess, like the the, the you know human vision because we have two eyes that are side by side, and um <laughs> and that was really you know the beginning of of aspect ratio is getting a bit wider and then it went further and further as they're just like no we need like bigger gimmicks uh for to, for movie theaters what about like cinerama and cinemascope and let's just get wider and wider and wider and um and now we have hey guys have you seen a movie in screen x yet no but no. i heard is this the one where they're kind of bringing back the smell of vision from the 50s <laughs> Uh, kind of. Yeah, it's uh, so I, I will say I don't know if I'll ever see a movie this way again. But I saw the third time I went to see Top Gun Maverick, I saw it in Screen X, Mm -hmm. because I heard that. I mean, again, I already seen it twice. And uh, when I heard the director talking about the way they designed the Screen X version, I was like, that actually sounds kind of fun. And I've already seen it (laughs) twice. So but yeah, it, 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 it this is the thing that I find really funny how uh, AMC has like the IMAX screens and the Dolby cinemas and just like the really pristine, like best, like best quality. Like that's that's the actual best experience watching a movie. And Regal's thing is now just like, oh, we've got 40X. We've got screen X. Right. We've we've got the we've got like the gimmicks that are just like, oh, if you just want to turn a movie into a theme park ride, you come to a Regal cinema. So screen X is the one where at points in the movie, basically in action sequences, the, um, they have like additional projectors that, pro- that that make the image extend onto the oh. walls on the sides. So it's like Cinerama. It, it, it straight up is. And it's a thing like they, they have a little like intro video to it for you that plays w- w- where they're like – you stay looking at the center of the screen as usual, but basically now the images extend into your peripheral vision. And the interesting thing with like watching Top Gun that way was that was realizing when I would occasionally like look at the walls, like going, oh, they they actually have like a lot of additional footage that was just cropped out of the original movie mm. that does extend over here. And like uh, apparently because like the the scenes in the like uh in the cockpits they would have like a six camera rig so they had the footage that like actually gave you like the cockpit wrapping like around you on from the sides and so uh so it's pretty fun uh you know if you've already seen it before and you want it you want a fun little gimmick to try again anyway um that was a long tangent that has nothing to do with <laughs> grand Budapest hotel but basically that was pretty much how aspect ratios came to be developed. They were like, you know, mostly just ways for Hollywood to try to compete with TV uh, by giving you more image um, and then hyping it up. And then once they were all established, then they basically just became creative choices where filmmakers could just be like, what is the best one to use to tell this story? And um, and for Wes Anderson, it was I'm going to have a different aspect ratio for each time period in the movie. Mm-hmm. And um that especially for like the bulk of the movie uh, is is a reflection of what what aspect ratio was available exactly. at the, the period that it's set. And it also for Wes Anderson works so perfectly considering uh, you, you have a like a more claustrophobic frame uh, that is tighter, but you so many shots are so like he uses the one point perspective constantly and you know it's it's Wes Anderson you know symmetry all that stuff that's his jam and but putting that within this perfect square is like kind of a new experience Mm -hmm. uh compared to like his his previous movies that I think works really beautifully I mean especially you look at just like the lobby of the Grand Budapest and that in this perfect square I'm just like I know I I I wouldn't want to watch this any other way. Like this is the right choice. Well, and then again, like in the 1968 or whatever it is, is when he's going super wide with it. And again, it's echoing how empty and desolate this place has become. It's it really is thematic. It's not just a stylistic choice. And Brad, it's really similar to when we've watched twice now The Aviator and how Scorsese Mm -hmm. and uh, the DP Robert Richardson would use uh, a coloration process that mimicked what was available at each time period of that movie. So the first like third of the aviator has this kind of bluish tint because that's what color film looked like in the early days of color film. And he's doing kind of a similar thing here, but I think it's even more thematic. 
I do just well, want to say uh, right now, uh, The Aviator is such a good looking oh movie. Oh my gosh. What a great movie. It's it, just gorgeous. We yeah. we constantly say like, I think it's an unsung masterpiece for Scorsese. It I think it, it just gets slept. Like, I feel like it's still regarded as like, oh man, he was just trying to win an Oscar and uh, and and doing some Oscar bait. And I'm like, that's that's just like, I mean, yeah, it's a biopic, but it's one of the best biopics anyone's ever, ever made. Yeah. It's so yeah. good. Well, also like it, they call it Oscar bait, but like Oscars is basically a group of your peers saying, hey, you're the best at what we do. So if <laughs> if your goal is to be the best at what you do, then I, I don't know how that's an insult. <laughs> right. All right, guys, before we get to final scores, we have one new segment that we've implemented just in the last couple of weeks here that we are calling Make It a Double. And that is where we take the movie that we're watching and we try to pair it with another film to make the perfect double feature. Now, Patrick, this could be something, you know, uh, thematic. It could be something stylistically similar. It could just be like, hey, this looks like an Ernst Lubitsch movie. And here's the shop around the corner. You know what I mean? So, Brad, let's start with you because I, we put Patrick on the spot here. If you were going to make this movie a double, what would you pick? You know, I was I was thinking about the main character of Gustav, and I was thinking about a very particular, specific type of character who is strange and unique and, and very into his own set ways and has his own ulterior motives. And you know what movie I thought of, Bob? Something we have done on the podcast. 1971's Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Oh, interesting. I I think I would pair this with it. It it is set in a similar kind of era and feel. And I I don't know. I just think that the the unique oddities of the main characters makes for a good double picture. Uh, right down to the purple suit. I, thank you. <laughs> I, I'm glad you picked up on that. <laughs> I like it. All right, I'm going to go in a vastly different direction here. And Brad, I've, I've tried to get really thematic with uh, with my picks and not just pick something that's <laughs> like, oh, I, this reminded me of this. But uh, the end of this movie, one thing that I really, really love, and we've talked about it already here, is that so much of the storytelling is about what's left unsaid and how, you know, F. Murray Abraham's character keeps saying, like, I don't want to talk about Agatha. At the end of this movie, it's just very matter of fact. You know, he asks what happened in the end. He says, in the end, he shot him. And then you get that final voiceover from the author saying, I really wanted to get back to the Grand Budapest Hotel, and I never did. And that's the literal end of the movie. And yet there's something kind of profound in how those lines are said. And it reminded me of a movie from 2010 by the Cohen brothers called True Grit. And these movies don't seem similar at all until you start thinking about the fact that, like, roughly... It tells a very similar story. It's about this this ingenue, this young person who starts following uh, a, an older, wiser person who's eccentric in his own way. Uh, violence and chases ensue. And then at the end of the story, you get this very matter of fact closing narration where Haley Steinfeld's character. Uh, I think that the last couple lines in the movie, I have it pulled up here. She's she's talking about uh, this character named LaBeouf. And she says, if he's yet alive, I'd be pleased to hear from him. I judge he would be in his 70s now, nearer 80 than 70. I expect some of the starch has gone out of his cowlick. Time just gets away from us. And that's the end of the movie. And I love how both of these movies meditate on the passage of time and then also don't meditate on it at all. And that's that's my pick for making it a double. These are really good answers. Patrick, you're on the hot seat now, man. <laughs> what, what, would you, what would you choose? Oh God, this is tough because I, th I, I I thought of two answers that are so wildly different that I'm just like, oh, oh God. man, give give them both, Patrick. <sighs> okay, I'll give them both. Uh, I think you two, I feel like both put more thought and care into yours. Mine are going to be more obvious and surface level. Um, okay, so my 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 two picks, which are I'm sure you know, neither of which will, will be surprising, are Paddington Two and The Shining. <laughs> Pretty much there the same go. movie. Exactly. And uh, because obviously, I'm, you know, Paddington 2 shares so much uh, aesthetically, mm -hmm. uh, tonally a lot of the time. It involves uh, an extended prison sequence and a prison escape yep. sequence and bonding with hardened criminals while wearing like striped prison uniforms. Um, except it uh, 
And, you know, it, it does also, uh, interestingly, kind of like reckon with death and loss uh, near the end, um, except it doesn't end in in quite a, a bittersweet way. But I'm like, they they have so much DNA in common that I feel like they just make sense to watch together. Absolutely. And, and then The Shining, obviously, you know, it's maybe the great hotel movie ever made. Grand Budapest Hotel is, is is a movie about looking back at the glory days of this hotel and, you know, you've got – and The Shining is a movie about people living in a hotel kind of being haunted by the ghosts of its glory days and it's also a meticulously designed location uh, with, you know, patterned carpeting uh, and all of that, a, a movie that's, you know, very much about – uh about d- death and wanting to live in <laughs> in in the past and i mean look at the at the end at the end jack torrance basically does get to you know get to get to stay in it back there forever um and so uh, i'm sorry to kind of cheat your your question you know your segments but uh but i'm like you know, depending on the mood you were in on a given day, here's two very different double features. I love it. No, actually, when I was trying to figure out why you had chosen this movie, I thought immediately like, oh, it's because he wants to work in a Paddington 2 reference into this episode. <laughs> but then I, I really, was, I, was I, I wasn't going to until the <laughs> segment. I really thought I was going to not mention it at all. Well, so then I was looking at the Wikipedia for this right before we started just to refresh myself of some of the names and stuff. And it said that when Robert Yeoman was trying to figure out like the color scheme of some of this movie, he started watching one from the heart. And I was like, oh, maybe Patrick wants to do like a really deep Coppola dive here and go in that direction, too. So I, I didn't know exactly where it was coming from. Ooh, ooh, uh, that would be a good one. No, I, I didn't even think of one from the heart. I hadn't done this research. And so I didn't know that he was looking at that. I mean, you know, one from the heart is a a good looking film. It is funny because I, 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 I wouldn't have thought of like Storaro as like an immediate reference point mm-hmm. for this I will say I have watched a bunch of just like videos and stuff online, just like breaking down the lighting of this movie because I'm fascinated by how Robert Yeoman like lit these sets uh, because especially like the lobby of the the Grand Budapest yeah. is enormous. I'm just like, how, 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 damn, how, how do you light this stuff? How do you even <laughs> light Wes Anderson movies? Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I want, look, as much as I love talking about my close personal friend, Francis Coppola, um, <laughs> uh, that was not my plan for this one. All right, guys, it is time for us to give final scores here on this podcast. We score the movie out of 10. You can give half points if you would like to. Brad, I'll go ahead and start us off here. This was not my favorite Wes Anderson film going into this miniseries. And I think having now rewatched Moonrise and this one, I think this one has really gotten close to taking Moonrise's place for me. I don't know if I like it quite as much as Royal Tenenbaums, which I still think might be his masterpiece. But this this is. I think even more deserving of the title of like a masterwork because it is such a document of his control over the environment and the script. And it, there's just not an ounce of fat on this thing. I'm going to give it a nine and a half out of 10, Brad. Yeah, man. I think I might be there with you. I, like I just Royal Tenenbaums is very close to this for me, but I don't know if I can imagine Wes Anderson perfecting his craft beyond this uh which you know hey if he's able to i i am excited to see it but i man i think i'm with you i'm gonna give it a nine and a half out of ten i I was really kind of flipping between a nine and a nine and a half but that yeah i i love this movie man this is this is everything i want wes anderson to be um, you know, I was just going to say nine, but I guess now that nine and a half is <laughs> is an option, you know, I'm I'm going to join in the fun. I don't, I don't want to be that weird guy where people are like, what was Patrick's beef with that movie? You only gave it a nine. <laughs> nine. Uh, I think nine and a half is the perfect score where you know it's not a perfect movie, but you want it to be a perfect movie because you like it so much. <laughs> It's also like it's a thing. For instance, I'm like on, a, you know, I, I assume you guys are probably like letterboxed users. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and I will say, I gave this movie a four point five uh, out of five hey. when I logged it earlier. There you go. Um, but I am always so hesitant to give out a five out of five. Mm-hmm. I almost never do. Mm-hmm. People have yelled at me for being like, "Why'd you give this like?" 
this obvious masterpiece of 4.5. I was like, I don't know. I feel like I need to watch it like 10 <laughs> times before I can fully decide. Yes. Five. Done. Perfect. Because I'm mean, like, like I, I have I can't point out a flaw in Grand Budapest Hotel. Also, here's the thing. If it, you know, I. Uh, I've probably given five stars to movies that do have flaws because, like, you know, who cares about stuff like that? I can't think of anything I'd change. I can't think of, like, what I, I would consider a genuine problem yeah. mm-hmm. with this movie. It is, like, as good as it can be. It, it's, it's, it's pretty much as good as a Wes Anderson movie can be. It's, like, for me, like, I guess Rushmore just, like, clicks with me personally a tiny bit more, even though I wouldn't call it a better movie than this. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so I don't know. We'll we'll say 9.5. I love it. We have successfully peer pressured one of our favorite YouTubers and filmmakers into agreeing with our score. So, uh, guys, it's a, it's a 9.5 across the board from us, but we'd like to know what you think. So reach out to us on our social medias. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and newly on TikTok at film whiskey. Or you can jump onto our Discord. We are on there every single day talking to you guys uh, about movies, about whiskey, and about all sorts of other things. Honestly, Bob, I, as I think about it, we need to dedicate uh, an entire channel on the on the Discord just to talking about Patrick Willems' videos. That, that, <laughs> I, think, I think we should. That seems to yeah. be the thing to do. Uh, but yeah, if you want to join our Discord, it is incredibly easy to download onto your phone or your desktop. Uh, You can find a link to it at the end of every single one of our show notes. We want to say thank you again to our guest today, Patrick H. Willems. Patrick, what do you have coming up that you'd like to plug? Well, guys, uh, pleasure to be here, as always. Thank you so much for having me back. Um, uh, The new season of my show uh, started back up recently. We've I think we've got an episode or two out now uh, after I took I took the summer off after finishing the movie. And so we're back at it again. Um, and you can watch my videos on, uh, on YouTube at youtube.com slash Patrick H. Willems, uh, or over on Nebula where they have no ads. Um, yeah, that's, that's, oh, oh and, and, and watch my movie, please. Uh, it, it's, it's fun. I promise it's on Nebula. It's Patrick, I, I will, I will confess for Bob and I both. We haven't watched it yet. Oh and the God. reason being, you invited me we back live on. two hours away from one another and we want to watch it together. <laughs> we, we literally and, wanted and to make a date night out of it. For real. Like, I'm like, like Bob introduced me to your channel and, and, you know, brought you onto the show. And I was like, we need to watch this movie together. And he has two kids. I have one, and and you know we both work full time jobs. But we're going to watch it soon. I promise. I I, I understand and I accept your excuse. Um, there, I mean, it's not going anywhere. It's it's not like I had like an opening weekend at the box <laughs> office where I was like, guys, we really gotta like open the top five this weekend. It doesn't matter. We'll watch it whenever you get a chance. It is more impressive though. I think that I have watched the forty five minute making of featurette before I've even seen the film. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I dove right in, man. I needed so the lore. you've all the spoilers now. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, we're, we're about to uh, actually, they'll be out at this point. The commentary tracks are, are also now available for the movie. So oh. you can also listen to those. You could also Patrick. listen to this episode as a commentary track on Grand Budapest because we're we're at an hour and a half on this bad boy. So we hope that yeah. you have enjoyed this, uh, this watch along with Patrick H. Willems. We'll be back on Monday to kick off another one of our mini series. We are going all the way back to classic Hollywood, and we're going to start watching the films of John Ford. So we're going to be back next Monday with the grapes of wrath. But until then I'm Bob book. I'm Brad G and we'll see you next time. <laughs>